for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. So, 06452017, I challenge you. I'm ready for it. Once upon a time, pond scum became all life on Earth. Stupid. Are Bengal tigers related to Burmese tigers and all other tiger species? Are all known species of tiger related to each other and all other panthers? Are all panthers related to feline, scimitar cats, and other felids? Let us begin with the cat clade. We know the eight main lineages go back to the Sudelurus, which it descended from the Proelurus. Proelurus is considered largely to be the first true cat and the ancestor of the entire cat family. Most studies support this, placing Polaris at the basal member of the feline classification. The bones of Proelurus are very similar to the living Beverids and Fossa of Madagascar today. Cat connoisseurs have long known that their feline friends have a wild origin. Now scientists have identified that the house cat's maternal ancestors are traced back to one place, the Fertile Crescent. Genetics proves that there are eight main lineages of the feline cat order. Seven of the eight major cat lineages are linked by hybridization. Only one, the bay cat lineage, has not been linked to hybridization but this is speculation to this day. These eight lineages, which are now 37 different species, all descended from eight types of base cats. The puma ancestor gave rise to the cheetah and the jaguar of today. The lynx gave rise to the Iberian and Canadian bobcats of today, and so on down the line. Today, we have 44 cat breeds alone, just in the common house cat. As you can see, it is very easy to track something back to a single species. Well, what happened when you track back to the eight main lineages? Well, when you find the branch narrows, you get to a few base cats, like the Pseudolirus and the Proalirus. Even a 2005 phylogeny study placed the Proalirus as a basal member of the feline family. So, not only do we have genetic data to support that this cat gave rise to all the cat kinds we see today, we can also see that the genetic data shows extinct felids found in a fossil record were cats as well. They just died out. We creationists could easily say that God had created two or three separate types of cat in the beginning during creation week. Why not? It just seems redundant to me, but I cannot know for sure but it's just as plausible that only one type of feline needed to exist during creation, as long as it contained all of the genetic diversity and heterozygosity needed to produce what we see in the world today. The evidence seems to be clear that God did create a single type of cat. Besides orphan genes and feline-specific ERBs and viruses, we even have more evidence outside of genetics now that shows the extent of the melanistic coat colors and patterns arose from a single original type that was either small spots or flecks. This is highlighted by changes observed in pelage patterns of jaguars and leopards during their development. Evidence is further backed up by a study by Liu and colleagues using their mathematical models. Since it's clear today that eight species of feline created all 37 species of feline and 44 cat breeds of today, then it's pretty obvious and feasible that God could have created a single feline to speciate into all the different kinds that we see today. Just like we now know for a fact that all humans descended from a single common female ancestor and we have all the different varieties and distinct people across the entire earth today. The original feline, nor any original species, didn't have to make it onto the Ark either. This is just an example of how many varieties can come from a single point. Unlike breeds of domestic horses, dogs, sheep, and cattle, some of which are thousands of years old, most cat breeds were developed within the past 150 years, mainly in Europe and the United States. Now, in the textbooks, phylogeny of carnivores links cats, skunks, raccoon, bear, and wolves, all as having a common ancestor, totally the opposite of creation's predictions. Why do they do this? 
Why do they assume this in the first place? It is solely because of taxonomy. Anything to them that falls into the carnivore can be linked. Thus, they now have to find other correlations to build their phylogenetic trees. So next, they use homology, which is just ridiculous to me because a raccoon, wolf, and cat, they have more differences than they have similarities. But like all things, anybody can see what they want if they look hard enough. Lastly, they use genetics. But what is genetic comparison between a cat and a raccoon, or a skunk, or a hyena, or a wolf? Well, that's a good question. Since cats and dogs are supposedly to be genetic cousins of the same tree, they should have a lot of similarities in biology, right? Well, even dogs were closer to humans at 95% than cats were to dogs. Then they found cats were closer to humans than dogs were to cats as well. Their common ancestry fell apart with observable, testable genetic data. This just proves how lousy it is to rely on homology or taxonomy to answer any of the tough questions. In conclusion, at least they did say that the cat was very biologically unique. But look, they had to make excuses for finding such genetic discrepancy. Such as, there must have been just too much domestication of the modern day dog's genome and not much of the cats to get this genetic similar match they were looking for. This is their rescuing device for the disaster which showed only a modest comparison between the two species of dog and cat, which were supposed to have more in common than all of the other species which ended up having more, even though those other species, being the cow and human, were well outside of the cat's own taxa claden species. Can a cat mate with a raccoon since they are supposedly a very close relative to one another? No. Frankly, I have no idea why they try to put these two together, because even taxonomically they are not the same. Cats are pure obligate carnivores, when raccoons are pure omnivores and always have been. It's the same with the skunk. Omnivores, not carnivores. Their entire physiology and internal anatomy are entirely different. So obviously, tossing these animals in via taxonomically, saying that they are all pure carnivora, is bias. They smuggle these animal species into carnivora taxa by using wordplay, altering the true meaning of carnivore, which should be meat-eating organisms which derive their energy and nutrient requirements from a diet consisting mainly of animal tissue. That's right, taxonomy says carnivory is just incorporating vertebrae flesh into the diet. This way, they can add something into carnivora if they need to without them ever being true carnivores or obligate carnivores. Basically, the only reason all these species made it into the carnivora group is because of their blade-like carnassial teeth match. Which is odd to me, because now we know many bears and dog species today do not eat flesh of any kind. So they assume relation mostly based on homologous teeth structure, even though everything else is vastly different. And in the case like bears, even that doesn't line up. That's right. True carnassial teeth do not develop in any bear. From intestinal length, salivatory pH, colon, body shape, etc., very little match down the line with any of these animals. No one would observationally look at a dog, cat, bear, or skunk and presume that they were related at all. Also consider, cats are observational and dogs are olfactory based, so they don't even match in that area. Assumption and hypothesis is all they really have to link common ancestry together. The matter of fact, since they also claim bears are in the same family, remember? Well, multiple bears now has pulled the rug right out from under them, all found to be fully fledged plant-eating vegetarians. As you can see, them trying to build their phylogenetic tree connecting all these animals together is totally worthless. Stick to genetics and follow it back. Stop assuming relation based primarily on homology. All they're doing is just digging themselves a bigger hole to get it out of with all their bias assumptions that they need to be true. Cats are genetically breaking down as well, like all things. That's right, mutations abound in the cat kind as well, with over 250 deleterious mutations that have been documented in domestic cats, including taillessness in Mannix cats, congenital defects of white cats, twisted tail syndrome in the American ringtail cats, split foot syndrome in Japanese bobtail, the white tiger lacked the capacity to produce red and yellow pigments. This is all caused by a single point mutation in their gene. 
This is all just more evidence and proof of genomic decay, which is our model of creation, and not evolution and adaptation, like evolutionists want to tell us. Things are not getting stronger, better, and more resistant. They are degrading and getting worse, and all of the evidence proves it. No storytelling required. We creationists also have allele evidence as well to help us determine a created kind. We say the more rare the allele is, the more mutated. The more common the allele, the more likely it was a created kind. All evidence from existing cat hybrids and lineages, the fossil record evidence and various other features including molecular sequencing data, genetics, pelage, patterns, and unique virus sensitivities, all point to the feline cat family representing a single, clearly delineated basic type. It is reasonable then, with all the evidence available, to say that all these felines arose from a single basal founded cat, and since then, they have passed through one or more adaptive radiations and speciations, exploiting their inherent morphogenetic potential to produce all the known existing and extinct species of cat. Thus, it is reasonable and logical for us as creationists to assume that there was a single cat that was created kind, because all of the evidence clearly shows this to be true. Now, could something prior to the pro allelis given rise to it? Sure, why not? But the fact remains, no genetic data, or any data for that matter, solidifies that opinion. The pro allelis is the first cat, the first of its created kind, and it populated the entire world we see today. That is what the evidence shows, and that is what we say. What about nymphorids, which are a genius of extinct scimitar or saber-toothed cats only found in North America, are considered not part of the cat order? I am confident that they are wrong on this assumption that nymphorids do not belong to the cat order. The difference between nymphorids and the feline order display only minute skeletal differences, indistinguishable in almost every area. This is why there was such a dispute. But calling an extinct cat a non-cat that is otherwise clearly a cat, simply for classification purposes and based solely on ossification bones in their ear, seems excessive and outright dishonest. Why do they do this? Well, because it doesn't match up with their phylogenetic tree that they made. So see how biased they are? If they need something to work, they will just make it up and place it where it wants regardless. Yet when it doesn't match up, they ignore it entirely. Nymphorids were like lions and tigers today. DNA has proven that yes, they were cats. What happened is that they speciated from the basal ancestor branch and died off because of extinction. Most people do not realize how easy it is for carnivores to die off. And since we're dealing with the cat species that transition to pure obligate carnivores, and carnivores are very susceptible to extinction, then we can see why there are so many extinct cats back in the fossil record. And we do see this even in many cat species alive today, which have died out via extinction, because they are carnivorous and ran out of food sources and pervasive selection from hyperdietary specialization. It is proven that hypercarnivory leads to increased vulnerability and extinction, even wear and cracking on their carnassial teeth may result in the death of the individual due to starvation. Carnassial teeth infection are common in domestic dogs and present as abscesses. As for the ecological niche of large carnivores, these animals typically make up only a small part of the ecological diversity of any given area. This fact directly relating to 1. the availability of food and success rate involved in catching something, and 2. territorially. If predators equaled or outnumbered their prey, while also having to contend with disease, injury, and other factors of mortality, the ecosystem would not be sustainable. Carnivores would eat themselves out of house and home, literally. Likewise, given the fact that carnivores do not migrate with herds, rather hold down territories, there is only so much room in a given area for carnivores of a particular species to exist. Given this observation, it is often strange when we come across mass assemblages of carnivores in the fossil record. To me, this is more proof that Noah's Flood helped these things form, such as massive dinosaur graveyards. Besides, observation and logic tells us that this is not how animals behave in the world we see today. So why assume that such a large number of predators congregated back then? Think about it. If the group doesn't seem to be a family or a social group, why were they together? The Bible has no documentation on what any of the created kinds were. So we have to infer, using as much genetics as possible, and even the fossil record unfortunately. And this is really tough because almost all life was wiped out because of Noah's Flood. 
The Bible is vague on the topic of created kinds because it is not a salvational topic, nor one that needed much attention. The word kind is actually used to describe many different things. Kind, a large group, are called animal kind. Then it is used again with bird kind. Then it becomes more specific with the hawk kind. So it's far too vague to give a specific definition. People should understand that it is an umbrella term, like mankind. Would you not classify a midget or an albino or a mongoloid part of mankind? Of course you would. The Hebrew word is where the attention should be, not the English word kind. Original word in the Strong's Concordance is that of min, like in minute. It is from an unused root word to portion out or to sort kind, species, a part of a whole, an amount, a section, or a piece of something. So this would mean that kind is a mixture between subspecies and order, and falls somewhere between that category. I think the tree of life is an artifact of uh, some early scientific studies that aren't really holding up. So the, the tree, uh, you know, there, there may be a bush of life. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Yes, uh, bush of I don't like that word. <laughs> Rich, Richard, oh, but that's only in terms right, I can see uh, that one, yeah. yeah. So there is not a tree of life, and in fact, from our deep sequencing of organisms in the ocean, out of now we have about 60 million uh, different uh, uh, unique gene sets, uh, we found 12 that look like a very, very deep branching, perhaps fourth domain of life. I think I'm done with you. Good, shut up. There's nothing to cry about, okay? was a created kind. It is the basal ancestor of all domestic and wild cattle we see. The Germanic people of Europe referred to it as Ur, meaning the wild ox. It entered the English language from Germany as Arox. The species survived in Europe until 1627. The oldest of cave drawings depict these first beasts. Before it died, it gave rise to two branches of all the cattle we see today. It led to the Zebu and the Bali cattle, which ended up populizing all of Indonesia. The other is related to the Eurasian subspecies, leading to the taurine cattle. A mitochondrial DNA study suggests that all domesticated taurine cattle originated from about 80 wild female aurochs in the Near East. Other species of wild bovines after this point were also domesticated, namely after the wild water buffalo, gaur, and wild banteng. All of these can be traced back to a single source, the Auroch. Even modern day species have ancestral alleles present. In this study, the focus is on evolutionary dynamics between bovids and bovine lentiviral proteins to find relation between species. They determine the sequence of three genes in the genre of buffalo, boss, and bison, and show that the bovine gene A3Z3 is under strong positive selection. They conducted a combination of studies consisting of molecular phylogenetics, structural biology, and experimental virology. What they found was that all of them are in the same family. This means that the Aurochs are the parent basal ancestor of the entire bovine and bison family. Now, let's talk about bovine diversity for a minute. There are two types of water buffalo today, the African Cape Buffalo and the Water Buffalo. There are 74 breeds of domestic water buffalo today, but only small numbers of wild water buffalo remain. The wild water buffalo is sometimes referred to as a different species, B. arni, but it can interbreed with other domestic water buffalo, so it is still a debate in the community. There are two types of bison, European and American. Four of the popular bovine species today became at least partially domesticated, all of which came from Western or Southern Asia, the cow, yak, bantang, and gaiao. Recently, they took all the cattle varieties in India and tracked them back using analysis of mitochondrial, Y-chromosomal, and microsatellite DNA. Two bovine species contributed to all of the Indonesian livestock, zebu and benteng, aka Bali cattle, which are the ancestral populations of those alive today, which descended from the aurochs and zebu mating. Remember, domestic yaks, gale, and Bali cattle are not direct descendants of the aurochs, they are way down the ladder and a far more current species. 73 modern cattle populations carry the ancestry of the sequenced Auroch genome still to this day. 
The Bas Secure de France is called the ancestor of the Aurochs for one reason only, because it was found in the Pleistocene Age Strata of India, which they say goes back 2.6 million years or so, or as recent as 11,700. So it's basically just more storytelling coming from SpongeBob universities. I mean, see for yourself. Use your own eyes. Look at the skeletal remains. They look absolutely identical to one another. The only thing that separates them is the geologic column. Modern day bovines are a genetic mess. I mean, look at the domestic yak, or wild yak for that matter. The domestic yak has a total of 3,187 deleterious mutations per individual, and the wild yak has a total of 2,067 deleterious mutations. What a disaster. This is utter proof and just another example in the long list of species alive today with massive genomic decay. Listen to what Julius Caesar writes in the Book of Galactic Wars about the Aurochs. These are a little below the size of an elephant, and of the appearance, color, and shape of a bull. Their strength and speed are extraordinary. They spare neither man nor wild beast, which they have espied. And again, just like with cat or the feline, we have bovine-specific ERVs as well. As you can see, there is no evidence anything came before it. All evidence points to bovine remaining bovine from the beginning of creation until now. R and raw, you have nothing to back up your arguments besides storytelling and lies. You should admit that you're a failure and just move on. I should have known better. That's what I thought. Capronese subfamily is a convoluted mess to sort out, consisting of two species of Sudaios, six Soro, four Garal, one Mountain Goat, seven Ovis, eight Ibex, two Caucasian Tur, one Barberry Sheep, three Tahar, and one Markor. Ancient biblical wording from Hebrew indicate that sheep and goat belong to a basic type or group belonging to the same kind in monobaromology. I was still able to determine the original created kind, even through this convoluted mess. I have determined it is the wild Benzora ibex, or the Persian ibex. This was the original goat of today. Let's begin with recent studies based on mitochondrial DNA, which prove the West Caucasian Tur appeared to be more closely related to this wild goat than even its own Eastern Caucasian Tur sister. This new genetic evidence conclusively proves that the Persian ibex wild goat is related to the genus, which until recently was not even considered related. The markor as well is related. It is only relatively separated by a little bit from other goat forms. Previously it had been considered a separate branch of the genus altogether. The perineum chamois, which descended from the wild goat, gave rise to the chamois which speciated into the growls and sorrows of today. New mitochondrial chromosome B testing and nucleotide substitution rate testing prove this. So much for the growls and sorrows coming first, like they assumed and told us for decades based only on fossils. And since we have validated genetically that the alpine ibex descended from the Persian ibex, then it is clear and obvious that we have narrowed down the basal ancestor for all living sheep and goats to the Persian ibex. Specifically regarding sheep, the wild goat, known as the Persian ibex, gave rise to the wild mouflon, which speciated into all the modern-day sheep we see today. Based on comparison of mitochondrial cytochrome B gene sequences, all six subspecies of sheep have been identified now, to the Siberian snow sheep, bighorn or doll sheep of North America, agrali of Central Asia, and the domestic sheep of Eurasia. Ureal is found in the western Central Asia and northern eastern Iran and western Kazakhstan to Pakistan all the way to India and trace back to the Mouflon. So we can be sure now as well that the wild Mouflon gave rise to the modern day sheep because genetics has proven this, which again should be the primary indicator of relation before one resorts to presumption via the fossil record. All modern domestic day sheep breeds descended from the ancestor of the Parisian ibex, the mouflon, and all domestic sheep today are from the mouflon and are numbering over 1 billion worldwide. You see, it is taught by evolution 
that multiple waves of independent migrations of wild goat had to have taken place in Europe. This is because of their assumption of old-scale timelines must be true, and this is why they rely so heavily on paleontological studies alone. They also have no consideration of Noah's flood distribution, which describes it to be just a single wave migration. They tell us the first migration wave occurred probably 300,000 years ago and led to the origin of the Alpine Ibex from the Parisian Ibex. The second migration probably took place around 80,000 years ago, leading to the origin of the Spanish Ibex. So with their scenario, no close relationship would be expected between these European species, right? However, current mtDNA data indicated that a much smaller genetic distance between these two Eurasian species than even between other existing Capra species. Thus, another scenario had to be proposed. After looking at the evidence, they had no other way of getting around the only possible conclusion, whereby the only one-wave migration was possible. It came from Europe, following by a speciation process that originated the two current species. A paleoontological find in Germany gave a detailed description of a capra specimen which included the characteristics of both modern taxa alive today, supporting the single wave hypothesis and aligning with Noah's flood animal dispersion predictions. Goats are among the earliest animals domesticated by humans, and most recent genetic analysis confirms the archaeological evidence that both the wild Persian ibex of the Zagros Mountains is the original ancestor of all domestic goats today. With even more studies, we have tracked sheep of the wild mouflon, and these mouflon have been traced to the Persian ibex, based on the new genetic evidence. The proof comes from the domestication of a bee subgroup in China, supported by genetic data, which comes from the wild ancestor of the domestic goat, i.e. the Benzora Persian ibex. This is just more conclusive evidence that we can easily track lineage back to a single root ancestor. Since people still do not consider these two related, because one is a sheep and the other is a goat, then I really must give substantial evidence to prove their relation. First, consider sheep are like dogs are to wolves. All dogs descended from wolves, just like all sheep descended from goats. Now, for more proof the mouflon and the ibex are related, the genomes of the wild mouflon and the Bizoran Persian ibex in the sheep and goat domestication center compared their genomes with that of domestics from local, traditional, and improved breeds. The goat was domesticated from the Bizoran ibex in the Fertile Crescent. This was discovered in 1996. This origin was confirmed by genetic studies based on mitochondrial and nuclear DNA. Also, more proof comes from the documentation allowing scientists to test specific skeletal remains. For those that think sheep and goat are not related, consider this. They can also breed with one another. Their offspring are called geep. Evolutionary scientists ignore genetic data over their fossil record. This is stupidity to say the least. Genetic data in 2005 from mitochondrial diversity data and phylogeographic structure of Chinese domestic goats proved that the Persian ibex was the basal parent ancestor of all modern-day sheep and goats. Also, of the 20 genomic region candidates common in sheep and goat, 14 selection signatures were congruent in both species. Even four genes showed pleiotrophic effects and have been related to phenotypic effects between the two. However, since they directly state that they use chromosome B because it evolves less rapidly, and they mix it with the fossil record to adjust and calibrate a timeline. This is all circular assumption based around an old timeline and evolution being true in the first place. It's why they will always fail at obtaining accurate results because they will never consider an alternative. While trying to figure out where the domestication center of sheep was, they began studying the haplotypes. In doing so, they confirmed that the mouflon sheep was the head of all the sheep family which itself descended from the Benzora Persian ibex of the Fertile Crescent. They tell us today that the Eotragus is the parent basal common ancestor of all Crefrids. This is all they have or evidence for that, by the way. Like I said, it's all storytelling. No DNA evidence, nothing. They go by a small handful of fossils. That is it. Evolution tells us that modern-day goats, sheep, deer, ibex, antelope, adox, gazelle, water buffalo, cows, and zebu have diverged from the rest of the Bobadilla in the early Miocene era, diverging from the Sybarids and the Giraffids from Eotragus. 
As you can see, they link the tree branches where there was no physical connection. This is how they build their tree of lies. Next, they tell us that the ancestors of the entire genus Caprala, aka goat, were Goral-like animals, which arose first, probably during the Miocene or early Pliocene era. Evidence for this is still lacking. It is just assumed from a single set of fossils which they believe are Goral's in appearance. But when genetics tells you one thing and fossils assume something else, you have to go where the biology evidence goes. You may be asking, so what other evidence do they have that these caprid cattle-like ancestors evolved into goats and sheep? Well, taxonomy. That's all. Just classification. Not biology, not genetics, or anything of value. I can understand that cladistics is a tool used to make a hierarchy tree of life and is the last line of defense used for lack of actual evidence and the only rescuing device used in their arguments when they have lost, but just repeating hierarchical classification names doesn't actually provide evidence or proof in any way, shape, or form, or that that one organism is the actual ancestor of another. It doesn't demonstrate evolution. It demonstrates whatever story you want it to be, or what anyone else wants it to be. There is no reason to assume that nodes of a cladiogram represent punitive ancestors, and without actual evidence besides observational homology of fossils, they have no true evidence, only assumption. And that is what fossils are, pure assumption. It is storytelling at best. It's just like saying those species had something physiologically in common with another, not that one gave rise to another. That is all pure conjecture, based on nothing. The evolutionist thinks it's obvious that if a very small group migrates away from a larger group, that the new group will obviously have less genetic diversity than the larger group that came before it. Yet, the evidence shows otherwise on every study that's been done. Let's look at a couple for just a minute. Let's look at the actual, observable, testable genetic diversity, shall we? Here are some reasons to believe that the simple models are actually not accurate at all. In 1957, a single pair of mouflon sheep were left on one of the Kruligan Islands near the Atlantic Circle. In the beginning of the 1970s, the number had grown to 100 individuals and peaked at 700 sheep in 1977. Given that the population began with only two individuals, the flounder effect, the researchers expected low genetic diversity, measured by heterozygosity. In 2007, the genetic diversity of the ancestors of those sheep was tested and found to be at least four times greater than the simple mathematical models predicted. In other words, the models underestimated the genetic diversity of the actual population because they had based all of their models of a preconceived notion that evolution was true. Take away the assumption and you were left with the facts. Other tests of these simplified mathematical models have failed as well. A small population of white-tailed deer introduced into the Finland were tested for their genetic diversity in 2012 and again found to have much more diversity than expected based on their simple models. Three more studies indicating that when direct genetic diversity was measured for animal populations on the verge of extinction, it was much greater than expected based on predictions derived from the mathematical models. The study involving sheep, bacteria, horses, and grave whales, in which the initial populations were all known, researchers measured the genetic diversity many generations after the initial populations were established. The genetic diversity was known down the line, was much greater than ever expected, again, based on models relating genetic diversity and population size. In other words, their assumption method failed validation in each of these cases where all known origin of two individuals were conclusively known. If these same models were used to estimate the effective sizes of the ancestral population from the measured genetic diversity at any point in time, they would have overestimated the original population sizes as much larger than two individuals. All models underestimated the genetic diversity of the actual population. So if observable data presents one thing and then scientists tell you another, why believe it? Oh, that's right, never mind, don't question anything. Their dating methods of diversity are all wrong because it's based on pure assumption. It presumes long-scale evolution to be true, so they just add it to all calculations. It's untrustworthy and I prove it because I use their own words. In 406 unrelated animals from 48 breeds of local varieties, 
The sequence segment spans 721 in relation to the full sheep mitochondrial sequence, even though Sanderson in 2003 used to estimate the time of the most recent common ancestor for each distinct domestic sheep lineage. They still came to the conclusion that mutation rates seem much faster and higher in the recent rather than the ancient phylogenetic history, Ho and Larson 2006. Yeah, no kidding. So they made up a presumed guest using an evolutionary assumption and it was not accurate. What a shock. But don't worry, the evidence was presented as old anyway. If you take into consideration this and the fact that all evolutionary predictions in the past put against real world results prove them to be a failure, it is safe to presume that they are completely off on their assumptions of this evolutionary history as well. We all know that they use biased trio dating methods, which assume long scale time evolution to be true. Now, how about even more direct observational testing methods? You are about to see how biased and indoctrinated they truly are. Look at this. All the represented molecular dates should be interpreted cautiously. They should not be strongly affected by the recent observational nonlinearity and apparent mutation rates, which suggest that mutation rates seem much higher in the recent rather than their ancient phylogenetic history. So, they got results that didn't line up because they were far too fast. Because they instead just assume an old-scale timeline must be true, they went around the actual observable testable evidence and made up their own. This is just the kind of science you get with SpongeBob universities worldwide. Next, orphan genes. The working assumption had been that, given common descent, and the fact that most housekeeping genes are shared among living things is highly conserved, including the prior assumption that evolution occurs by extremely small changes. Orphan genes should be rare, if not non-existent. However, as scientists sequenced more genes from different organisms, they are discovering that roughly 10-40% to 40 of each genome's protein coding sequence is new. That is, unlike any other known protein coding sequence. These are orphan genes. And this was one of the biggest surprises to come out of the whole genome sequencing project. Before I can get into it, remember this quote by noble Laurel Francis Jacob. He explained the accepted view of how evolution constructed new genes. He said, Once life has started in the form of some primitive self-replicating organism, further evolution had to produce through alterations of already existing compounds. As you can see, new genes must arise from pre-existing genes, leaving the signal of ancestry in their closely related sequences, because the probability of an alternative is basically nothing. Zero. That is why the discovery of orphan genes, which now show no homology to other sequences, came as a great surprise. It was assumed that getting new genes was hard, and once a workable solution was found, it would be preserved in the descendants that followed. The bulk of genes would have been invented early in evolution, and thus would be broadly shared. However, orphan genes are without detectable homologies in other lineages. Orphans are a subset of taxonomically restricted genes, which are unique to a specific taxonomic level. To put it another way, orphan genes differ from all other genes in that they are lineage-specific, with no known history of shared duplication and rearrangement outside of their specific species or clade. This is yet another way we are able to identify what a created kind is. A human would share orphan genes with primates if common ancestry were true. The fact we share 0% is utter proof that humans were a separate created kind and creationism is true, not common descent. The more genomes that are sequenced, the more the proportion of orphan genes should shrink if common ancestry were true, as more and more orphans should be shown to be present in other genomes. But that is not proven to be the case. The mountain of orphan genes is growing with every new clade tested, not shrinking. Similarly, horizontal gene transfer was not borne out. The sister genes of orphans should have been found as sample size increased, reducing the proportion of orphan genes. As for gene loss as an explanation, well, it would have been too massive to be realistic to account for the pattern seen. The fact we find orphan genes can only decay but never give rise is also more evidence for our side as well. No testable, observable studies have ever proven that new orphan genes can arise in a species which already had or lost them. The only place this has happened is in the imagination of textbooks. 
It is also a fact that they are genes without detectable homologies in other lineages. So a fly orphan gene and a human orphan gene are very unique and identifiable. If common descent were true, we should see traces left behind of the orphan protein three-dimensional structure in other species, especially those closest on a taxonomic level, and that is not what we see. Orphan genes are a wonderful for creationists and a nightmare for evolution. David Usuri, a biologist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee, and his collaborators compared 1,000 genomes. They found trying to build relations for phylogenetic trees is a waste of time because genetically there is not enough shared information between all life. They state, and I quote, There are different ways to have a core set of instructions, but of the 1,000 genomes available, not a single protein is conserved across all genomes. The 2018 Gene Research Study looked through 5 million genetic imprints on 100,000 animal species throughout the world to find one of the most surprising discoveries about evolution to date, that they have all been wrong. Evolution predicted that everything evolved up from a single cell, yet this new research looked at a selected portion of DNA from a hundred thousand different species by hundreds of different researchers from around the world. They found a telltale sign showing that all animals emerged at about the same time. Not only that, the study also found, rather unexpectedly for evolutionists, that species have clear genetic boundaries and nothing much in between. They go on to say in the study that humans and animals arose at the same time and there are genetic boundaries. Thatcher goes on to say, if individuals are stars, then species are galaxies. They are compact clusters in the vastness of empty space. The absence of in-between species is something that also perplexed Darwin, he said. This massive genetic study which reveals that all life on Earth, including animals, birds, insects, and humans that all appeared at the same time, should be cause for concern for the evolutionist. Their rationalization and excuses will come soon, but even the researcher himself stated, The conclusion is very surprising, and I fought against it as hard as I could. How does one explain that fact that 90% of all animal life, genetically speaking, is roughly the same age? Their answer? You guessed it. There must have been an environmental trauma causing a bottleneck that caused all living species to reduce to just a few living number of individual males and females to repopulate. Pfft. Ridiculous. So what they're trying to tell you is that this so-called bottleneck for it to occur had to reduce all 100,000 different species that they tested to a single maternal lineage to replace all the others to carry the entirety of the linked genome along, thereby resetting mitochondrial variation to zero. Does that sound logical at all? Even in their own peer-reviewed paper, they state that it's not logical. They say, based on contemporary mitochondrial sequence data alone, it is impossible to distinguish an organismal bottleneck from mitochondrial and Y chromosome specific lineage shortening since both mechanisms make the same prediction of a uniform mitochondrial sequence in the past. So they know and say that they cannot know this, but they will tell you that it happened anyway and expect you just to believe it because. In conclusion, they don't have evidence for this so-called bottleneck, not even their own fossil record shows any evidence of one. And, their long time period is all extrapolated from an assumption that a common ancestor exists. They go on to say, For the planet's 7.6 billion people, 500 million house sparrows, and 100,000 sandpipers, genetic diversity is about the same. They would never submit to the actual evidence of the research which shows that it's obvious that all life arose at the same time. As Kuhn points out, the unresolved arguments tend toward rhetoric. Like all scientists, they struggle to find an example or excuse to puzzle an explanation together before they commit corporate suicide for discovering evidence contrary to the evolutionary theory. They directly state, This study is one of the clearest, most data-rich, and general facts in all of evolution, that the existent population, no matter what the current size or similarity to fossils of any age, has expanded from mitochondrial uniformity. They even directly state 
that they used the fossil evidence of mammalian evolution in Africa theory to infer an old age of 100 to 200,000 years based on nothing but assumption, and that sequence analysis has been interpreted to suggest that the last ice age created widespread conditions for a subsequent expansion. Because no actual evidence was seen for evolution, they just had to presume it happened and conclude this by stating, the vista of evolution is best seen from the passenger seat. Why? Because they have no direct access to the driver's seat to witness linear macroevolution occurring. This study was just a perfect nail in the coffin for evolution. Their rescuing device excuses might be enough for the atheist, but it's not for the open-minded freethinker. Another example of a very precise prediction concerns our yolk. However, eutherian mammals like us have a placenta that made the yolk sac obsolete. <laughs> the yolk sac is not obsolete. Think about it. If the yolk sac is a worthless remnant nowadays, like he says, then obviously it can be cut off from the human embryo because it isn't needed, right? Not at all. The yolk sac is the source of the human embryo's first blood cells and a blood nutrient supply. It's 100% required, as death would result without it. Lumen, the Boundless Anatomy and Physiology website, even tells us, blood is conveyed in the walls of the sac by the primary aorta. After circulating through a wide meshed capillary plexus, it is returned by the vitiline veins in the tubular heart of the embryo. This vitiline circulation absorbs nutrient material from the yolk sac that is conveyed to the embryo. It is true that the yolk sac of birds and reptiles contain yolk to nourish the embryo, but the placental mammal's yolk contains no yolk at all. Also, this so-called yolk sac is not a source of nourishment as it is for birds, or in a bird egg. Rather, its purpose and design is that of blood supply, proving it is not proof of evolutionary leftover remnants. To say that it's lost its primary function is intellectually dishonest. It's always had a function, and it was that of blood supply. Even Wikipedia acknowledges its importance by saying its function as the developmental circulatory system of the human embryo before internal circulation begins. Even embryologists today no longer call it a yolk sac, but umbilical vessel, because of its vital importance. This excerpt was taken from Larson's Human Embryology, 4th edition. The definitive yolk sac remains a major structure associated with the developing embryo through the fourth week and performs important early functions. Extraembryotic mesoderm forming in the outer layer of the yolk sac is a major site of hematopoiesis. Primordial germ cells can first be identified in humans in the wall of the yolk sac. Even by mistake or mutation, a human being cannot produce yolks or gills because we don't have, and never had, the DNA instructions for that. It's disingenuous to say that this proves evolution. Even study.com states, it was originally thought that human yolk sac was a vestigial organ, no longer of use to the embryo. But research over the past decade or so has brought new insight into the use of the yolk sac by the embryo. Also consider vitrolene circulation, the system of blood flowing from the embryo to the yolk sac and back again. This system would not even exist at all without the yolk sac. This was never a useless, leftover remnants of a yolk sac. It was never a yolk sac at all, and should never have been called one. Hence, the modern day name change. Do you see the lengths evolutionists have to go to to present any evidence to support the lie? One can only wonder why evolutionists would call the structure by the wrong name and label it a primitive, when it's absolutely necessary for the survival of the developing individual. However, eutherian mammals like us have a placenta that made the yolk sac obsolete. Entologists predicted an ant fossil that had features of wasps in the Cretaceous and that was confirmed as Sphecomyrma. For one thing, this species was never found to ever have any wings. No Sphecomyrma hamuli was ever found around the anterior portions. As were wasps, their fore and hind leg wings are hooked together with groups with tiny little hooks called hamuli, which ants do not have. 
also consider, according to evolutionists, it was believed that this evolutionary age of 79 to 92 million years ago, there had not yet been any complex social organizations of ants into colonies. However, with careful analysis of these specimens, it reveals the presence of the metapleural gland, which is only found in ants and only those that live in colonies. These glands secrete antibiotics which prevent bacteria and fungi entering the colonies. Ants were always ants. They never transitioned into flying, nor became wasps. Not a single drop of observational or testable science proves that ants became wasps. You may have heard me say, because I've said it so many times, that I often find that I have to educate evolutionists while I'm debating them. In this video, I'm going to show you a remarkable example of me doing just that. A beautiful example. I don't think a better example could be had. I recently debated two fellows at the same time about evolution and creation. One of them, James Downer, the other, uh, uh, Jackson Wheat. And Jackson Wheat brought up the Italian wall lizard as evidence of evolution. And I explained to him that there was no such thing as evidence of evolution. Now, this science paper I want you to pay attention says anatomical and physiological changes associated with dietary shift in this lizard. This part, this here, this word anatomical in this paper, that's a lie. There was no anatomical difference. There was physiological change only. Just to help you understand the subject, this is what was mentioned. In 1971, researchers loosed a few examples of this particular lizard on two islands in the co off the coast of Italy in the Mediterranean. And researchers went back 36 years later and found some of these lizards and they examined them and they discovered that they had what are called sequel valves in their stomachs that don't exist in the parent population from the mainland. They declared this to be evolution in action. In only 36 years, the organism had evolved sequel valves in its stomach. Well, that's not true. It didn't evolve anything. It adapted. That's all it did. The lizard already has the same organ called a sequel valve. It's not actually an organ. What it is is a muscle in the stomach. They already have this muscle. All that happened was that the muscle became more robust in response to a plant diet. They used to eat lizard... Uh, uh, animals like uh, crickets and mealworms and grasshoppers, things like that, and then loosed on the island, they had to adapt to a plant diet. The plants are tough and hard to chew, so the lizards adapted to that environmental change, that dietary change, by getting a more, more robust jaws, you know, bigger, slightly bigger jaws, slightly wider heads, an elongated gut, and the an increased size to this muscle in the stomach that helped them to digest the plant matter which is tar harder to digest than animal matter like uh, grub worms and uh, earthworms and crickets and such things. So that's the changes that the lizard experienced. Now in my debate Jackson Wheat brings up this lizard and says look evolution in only th 36 years but that's not what happened. What happened was, as I explained to him, this is an example of nothing more than phenotypic plasticity. Mutations did not occur that created in the genetic information for the organism to have sequel valves in its stomach. Firstly, it already has sequel valves. It just, the muscles are less robust. And it wasn't random genetic mutations that did it. The organism gained no new genetic information to create an anatomical feature that did not exist in the creature before. But the evolutionists are still claiming, we still have evolutionists claiming, that this is an example of evolution. This actually was an embarrassment to evolutionists when science scientists discovered uh, by experimentation that this creature expressed its genes to make the sequel valve more robust, the muscle in its gut more robust, and these minor uh, morphological changes, these adaptations, to their environment. Now creationists understand organisms adapt. That's a beautiful example of intelligent design that organisms can adapt. But no genetic information arose that creates sequel valves in the organism's stomach. And one of my debate opponents, uh, uh, Jackson Wheat, claimed that random mutation 
is what produced them, that mutations created new genetic information that produced sequel vials in the gut of this lizard. I told him that wasn't so. I told him they already had the genetic information to create the sequel vials, and all this was was phenotypic plasticity. He argued with me and said, no, I was wrong. But what we find out is that he was wrong. And, in fact, he uploaded a video not long ago explaining that he was wrong, admitting it without admitting it. You know, evolutionists, they don't like to admit they were wrong. They'll d so what he did was make a video trying to save face for being shown wrong about this in our debate. And I'm going to show you the proof of that. So here's how I educated Jackson Wheat in our debate. I informed him that there was no anatomical change take place in the animal, that the organism simply expressed its genes in one way so as to make the sequel valve appear, that is the muscle become more robust in the gut, and when it's it, when examples of these lizards were taken into the laboratory by scientists and, and examined, they were given then an animal diet of grub worms and crickets and such. The sequel valves seemed to quote unquote disappear. They didn't actually disappear, they just stopped being robust. The muscles are still there, they just went down to their normal size again. And Jackson Wheat denied this. He said uh, that the sequel valves arose because of random mutations. That he said genetic mutation had, was responsible for the sequel valve appearing in the body plan in the anatomy of the animal. And that's not true. Then when I told him that researchers had taken these creatures into the laboratory in a controlled environment, changed their diet, the sequel valves quote unquote disappeared again, that is actually reduced to their previous size, he denied that. He said that wasn't true. So those are the two things that I had to educate Jackson Wheat about. Then he uploads a video admitting that everything I told him was true as a way of trying to save face because he doesn't want to look like somebody who denies science. So here's the results of that. Have you ever heard of Italian wall lizard? There was a population uh, move uh, from one island to another sure. and by, via natural selection they developed new characteristics. New no, they didn't. characteristics. No. Yes they did actually. They have no, changed God. both ethologically uh, and they have changed in their morphology slightly uh, because it's only a few decades sure. but they have changed. And sure. Can, See, I discussed that. That's we one of the know. first things I talked about we, when I got on the know. internet. We know that this occurred via mutations and recombination generating genetic diversity. We know that this occurred via mutations and recombination. Now here's a snippet from Jackson Wheat's video that he uploaded not long ago after our debate in which he admits that I was exactly right when I told him that mutation and natural selection weren't responsible for the development of sequel valves in the anatomy of the lizard. But it was nothing more than phenotypic plasticity, which is exactly what I told him. That the organism already had the genetic information to produce the sequel valve, and they simply expressed it to make the muscle uh, in the gut more robust, and then later when the diet changed, it was less robust. He denied the researchers had done this, and he denied that genetic mutation uh, mutations were not uh, the mechanism for it because needing he needs as an evolutionist to believe that random mutations and natural selection has designed all the features of living things. Now here's a snippet from the video he uploaded later to try to save face in which he points to the very scientific research paper that I told him about in our debate that researchers had taken these lizards into a controlled environment changed their diet back to an animal based diet and the sequel vir allegedly disappeared. It didn't actually disappear. It simply became less robust. It shrank in size because the organism changed the way it expressed its genes. That's called phenotypic plasticity. Authors of some of the original studies on the Podmercaro lizards predicted that the sequel valves were the result of genetic changes, but later studies showed that they were instead the result of phenotypic plasticity. Here he is in our debate denying that phenotypic plasticity was the cause for the sequel valve change in the organism. He had claimed that random mutation developed the sequel valve, then discovered that I was right because he points to the scientific paper that ex explains that very thing. But here he is denying it in our debate, that uh, claiming that mutation is what it generated the sequel valve instead of phenotypic plasticity. And when I explained to him that researchers had verified this, 
uh, he said that wasn't true. Then later in his video he put up trying to save face, he points to the very scientific paper that I pointed to in our debate in which I told him researchers verified this by taking the animal into a controlled environment, changing its diet, and the sequel valves reduced to its normal size. We know that this occurred via mutations and recombination. Authors of some of the original studies on the Podmercaro lizards predicted that the sequel valves were the result of genetic changes. We know that this occurred via mutations and recombination, but later studies showed that they were instead the result of phenotypic plasticity. We know that this occurred via mutations and recombination, phenotypic plasticity and not mutations, phenotypic plasticity and not mutations. We know that this occurred via mutations and recombination, but later studies showed that they were instead the result of phenotypic plasticity, phenotypic plasticity and not mutations. We know that this occurred via mutations and recombination, phenotypic plasticity and not mutations. We know that this occurred via mutations and recombination, phenotypic plasticity and not mutations. So here's the claim. Okay, so this is what actually happened. They released a lizard on an island in the Mediterranean. Uh, oh. They came back 36 years later. Researchers collected some of these uh, lizards and they studied them and found sequel valves in their stomachs that were not there. They're not in the parent population that existed on the mainland of Italy. Okay, so they then they changed the diet of these lizards in a controlled environment to an arthropod no, diet. No, they and, did not. And, but later studies showed that they were instead the result of phenotypic plasticity. After 16 weeks, they, these, uh, the sequel valves disappeared again. So what this demonstrated is that a change in the environment when the lizard was loosed on the island, a change in its diet caused the organism to respond to that environment by stop expressing the genes that produce sequel valves in its stomach. Then when the organism was taken from the That's island delicious. and back to the mainland and its diet was re reverted to its original, they gained the sequel, they, they lost the sequel valves again. So all this and, proved uh, is that the genetic information Information to produce the sequel valves already existed in the no, lizard. No, that is the beginning. not what that means. Mutation didn't design it. It was that is not what that means. Made. So all this and, proves uh, is that the genetic information to produce the sequel valves already existed in the no, lizard. No, that is beginning. not what that means. Mutation didn't design it. It was that is not what that made. means. So you just heard Jackson Wheat say, "No, that is not what happened. Uh, that the researchers didn't verify." that it was phenotypic plasticity and not random mutations building the information that creates sequel valves. In our debate, that's what he claimed. But then in his later video, after he investigated the paper that I told him about, he found that that's exactly what happened, that it was phenotypic plasticity and not mutation which developed the sequel valves. Authors of some of the original studies on the Podmercaro lizards predicted that the sequel valves were the result of genetic changes, but later studies showed that they were instead the result of phenotypic plasticity. We know that this occurred via mutations and recombination, phenotypic plasticity and not mutations. The fact that the aforementioned morphological changes were likely the result from phenotypic plasticity and not mutations does not invalidate their significance to our understanding of evolution. There you have it. An example of how you have to educate evolutionists when you debate them, as I've said many times. Uh, Jackson Brown, uh, James Downard and Jackson Wheat denied that the changes to the sequel valve in the uh, Italian wall lizard was produced by random mutations and this was of course in line with what evolutionists believe that mutations accruing add the information to create the various new structures that appear in the body plans of living things and this is why we have a tree of life. If this is a negative impact on the evolution theory. He wasn't want to believe that either but of course it does uh, have a negative impact on evolution because evolution is simply false. So uh, here we have Jackson Wheat doing a double take denying that firstly that first claiming that random mutations had developed sequel valves in the stomach of these lizards, which was not so, and denying that researchers had verified this by taking the lizards into a controlled environment, changing their diet, and watching the sequel valves disappear again. He denied those things in our debate, then later makes a video where he describes the very scientific paper that I told him about in our debate, which he, and which he said did not happen, 
that the researchers did not take these animals into a controlled environment and verify that the sequel valve was produced by phenotypic plasticity and not mutations, accruing new genetic information which developed sequel valves. He denies that. Then he makes a video admitting this without admitting he was wrong. So here's how I educated Jackson Wheat in a debate and James Downard, because you have to educate them about science when you debate them. And so uh, Jackson Wheat uh, admitted that he was wrong about two claims in his debate, and then uploads a, uh, by uploading a video which he talks about it as though this is going to save face. Um, it doesn't. Uh, I had to educate him. His claims were wrong. It was not random mutations that developed the information that created sequel vows. It was phenotypic plasticity, exactly as I said. It was verified as phenotypic plasticity by researchers when they changed the diet of the lizards in a controlled environment and the sequel vials disappeared again. He denied that that happened as well. Then uploads a video trying to save face where he admits everything I told him in our debate was true. That's how it works with evolutionists. You have to educate them while you debate them. So all this and, proof uh, is that the genetic information to produce the sequel valves already existed in the no, lizard. No, that is beginning. not what that means. Mutation didn't design it. it was that is not what that there. means. We know that this occurred via mutations and recombination. Authors of some of the original studies on the Podmercaro lizards predicted that the sequel valves were the result of genetic changes. But later studies showed that they were instead the result of phenotypic plasticity. We know that this occurred via mutations and recombination, phenotypic plasticity and not mutations, 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 phenotypic plasticity and not mutations. We know that this occurred via mutations and recombination. As we've mentioned on this channel before, the hallmark of a good theory is its ability to make predictions. I'm guessing he'll just ignore the massive amounts of failed predictions in this video. A hypothesis must have predictions, must be accurate in explaining the world around us. Okay, let's look at the Bible, for example. The Bible tells us clearly that it is the history book of the universe. And yet, why is the known genetic data so absolutely consistent with a biblical-based model? It's really far too close for comfort for the evolutionists. We've made future testable predictions, for example, on mutation rates. We've made testable predictions on mutation rates in the Khoisan peoples, on DNA function. We've made flood geology-related predictions. Prediction after prediction. When we actually look at the genetic data, for example, let's make some retrodictions. Let's see if the Bible really is the history book of the universe. Biblical Adam and Eve predictions, for example. Well, you'd predict low genetic diversity. You'd predict one Y male ancestor, one mitochondrial DNA female ancestor. The fact that most genes come in two versions. If Eve was taken from Adam, Noah's flood predictions, for example, you'd predict that all people should be closely re related. There's only a few mitochondrial DNA lines, the one Y chromosome line, evidence of rapid population growth. And at the end of the day, we actually see based on the three main events in scripture, specifically in Genesis, we can actually address these with modern genetics. These events, for example, the creation of Adam and Eve, the flood of Noah, the Tower of Babel. Let's look. Let's look at the data. We now know that all human beings are actually profoundly similar genetically, and this points directly 
to Adam and Eve. If you only started with two people, that restricts the diversity today. Over deep, deep time, any large population, of course, I hope Jackson understands this, will most certainly and un undoubtedly accumulate enormous numbers of mutations, resulting in enormous amounts of genetic diversity. This is a serious problem for evolutionary theory because it is now absolutely clear that mankind has very limited genetic variation. While the observed and low genetic diversity is a massive problem, of course, from the evolutionary perspective, the perspective and the fairy tale that Jackson here is pushing, this is most certainly expected and predicted, as I've said, from the biblical perspective. From the biblical model, we all come from just two people. This obviously means that limited diversity is easy to explain. The Bible predicted this. This means the death and demise of the evolutionary bottleneck theory and the evolutionary out of Africa theory. Now, what they're going to say, they're going to resort to a near extinction event in order to reduce homogeneity, but it would cause permanent and severe genetic damage. For example, enormous numbers of deleterious mutations will undoubtedly go to fixation. But based on this low genetic diversity, based on the fact that every single human being in the world is very similar, they have to resort to what they do best, a rescue device. Jackson Weed here presents some predictions. Why doesn't he talk about all the failed predictions, all the inconsistencies? all the contradictory evidence they cherry pick selective and preferential treatment of data of course this apparent bottleneck this near extinction event it is just that it is a rescue device how could such a tiny nearly extinct genetically compromised population suddenly explode into all parts of the planet and seizing dominion over the world because this hypothetical it's all storytelling it's all hypotheses unsupported hypotheses and this apparent evolutionary bottleneck although it might have been able to reduce overall human diversity which is what they're trying to do to explain the data you must understand and jackson here talks about post hoc explanations rationalizations well, this is just a post hoc embellishment to the evolutionary fairy tale. It is not actually credible at all because as I hope he understands, small bottleneck populations have extreme problems. For example, there are approximately 10,000 cheetahs in the world today. Look it up. And conservationists, people who are worried about this, they acknowledge that the cheetah is already showing serious signs of inbreeding and genetic decline. Genetic diversity has eroded, of course, based on inbreeding. The evolutionary bottleneck hypothesis that they pull to explain this data, but the Bible already predicted it thousands of years ago, involving this extended near extinction event, which is obviously associated with severe inbreeding, as I've demonstrated here, it's not even remotely plausible or feasible. So from the evolutionary perspective, human genetic homogeneity still remains, regardless of what they want to tell you, regardless of the rescue device and story that they pull, remains a very serious theoretical problem. But according to us, according to the biblical based model and biblical perspective, there is absolutely no problem with a relatively homogeneous human population. We start with just two people, of course. And this population bottleneck, according to the Bible, is benign. And then 10 generations later, we see a second single generation bottleneck of just eight people occurred at the time of Noah. And both bottlenecks, of course. Read Genesis. Look at the data. They were both very brief and then followed by explosive growth. And in both of these cases, there would have been almost no previously accumulated mutations. We see the accumulation of low impact, near neutral deleterious mutations. We see genetic entropy. Take that back to a point of least genetic entropy. That would be a point of creation. At this point, 
there wouldn't be that accumulation of mutations and hence no inbreeding effects, of course. I can't believe evolutionists still bring up that objection. It's a straw man. So very limited human genetic diversity is a massive, it's pretty much a fatal problem for evolutionary theory and it leads to unrestrained storytelling. That's what they do. The evolution story needs to be revised almost annually. Yet limited human genetic diversity is very obviously compatible with the biblical perspective and does not actually require any far-fetched mental inventions. And I mean, we can go on and on and on about these predictions. We can go on and on and on. I mean, for example, let's look at Noah's flood. This story tells us that all people should be closely related. It tells us there should be only a few mitochondrial DNA lines as Shem, Ham, and Japheth's wives, and only one Y chromosome since it's only Noah. His three sons would have inherited his Y chromosome, and we should have significant evidence of rapid population growth, and it turns out this too is exactly what we find in modern genetics. Guess what? This did not all have to be true. The Tower of Babel account, for example. We have found a single dispersal of all people in the relatively recent past, who traveled in these small little people groups into uninhabited territory through the Middle East. Too close for comfort for evolutionists. They call it the out of Africa story. As of as I've shown and demonstrated, that's dead. But these are all biblical based predictions. We've talked a lot on this channel about how evolution is used to understand the past. But today we're going to talk about how evolution can be used to predict the future. If the evolution of all organisms from a set of common ancestors is true, then we should be able to test that. An example of a modern prediction of evolution is one we have discussed at length, the chromosome 2 fusion, including all its details. Using these frequencies, we can generate a graph like this, showing the signature of mutations. If mutations were also the cause of interspecies genetic differences, then we would predict a similar spectrum graph when counting up the different types of nucleotide differences between humans and chimps. And we do. This makes no sense under a non-evolutionary model. Under creationism, it implies that a creator created interspecies DNA differences that just so happened to look exactly as though they had occurred by the same natural processes that give rise to within-species differences. It also makes no sense under a non-evolutionary model why genetic sequences for homologous proteins converge the further you go back in time, which was, by the way, also predicted under evolution. Jackson Weed here uses a lot of arguments that assumes the majority of our genome is actually non-functional or simply based on evolutionary leftovers. Evolutionists like Jackson here, they assume that all DNA differences are the result of mutations over time, of course, and based on our model of pre-existing functional heterozygosity, we would actually assume and predict that the majority of our genome is created diversity, that God in place, God encoded these functional DNA differences from the start. And what's funny is we now know that the junk DNA era has been completely overturned. For example, this human chromosomal two fusion that Jackson here says arose through a fusion of two ape-like chromosomes, that alleged fusion, that alleged site where the fusion supposedly took place actually represents a highly organized functional gene. And as you can see, there's significant lack of evidence for a, a cryptic centromere site. And we're going to get more in to these various arguments that he uses on endogenous retroviruses, specific pseudogenes, things that assume evolutionary leftovers, and we're going to get more into that. But in regards to the chromosome 2 fusion, he fails to mention that Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins wrote a extensive technical paper in February the 8th, 2017, titled Debunking the Debunkers. It's a response to criticism and uh, regarding the refutation of the human chromosome 2 fusion paper that he originally put out back in 2013. And in this paper, you can read for yourself, you see a ton of genomic data, data after data, evidence after evidence that clearly shows that the alleged fusion site really is a promoter in this DDX 11L2 gene and that the activity, contrary to Jackson Weed and other evolutionists that have attempted to rebut this 
incoming evidence is neither nominal or spurious. And there's so much data um, in this paper and, and coming about that you can read that shows that the alleged cryptic centromere site has actually no homologous chromosomal matches in the chimpanzee genome. And I quote word for word here from this paper titled Debunking the Debunkers that it is also shown the site is too small to represent a centromere and that interstitial alphoid repeat regions are common on many human chromosomes including chromosome 2 that has six different alphoid rich repeat regions outside the centromere. However, the most negating evidence against the cryptic centromere site is that it is completely situated inside the actively expressed protein coding gene. In fact, Dr. Tompkins says in this paper, sections of it extend across both intron and exon regions according to a line transcript and the alleged cryptic centromere is clearly a functional part of a protein coding gene and not the remnant of a centromere now according to the pre-existing heterozygosity model the created heterozygosity model we would predict that the vast majority of our genome is functional of course and Jackson here uses some of these shared genetic mistakes, these pseudogenes to prove evolution. For example, the broken remnants of an egg yolk gene. And these pseudogenes are now known to be functional DNA elements and not actually mistakes. The junk DNA era, the junk DNA paradigm, it is dead. It's been overturned. And the fact is we understand very little of, a, of the DNA language. We're, we're dealing with a very foreign language here. And we've only just begun to discover and uncover just how functional the human genome really is. It's mind boggling how many experiments would actually be necessary to conclude with any with any amount of confidence that a certain set of DNA sequences has absolutely no function at all. And there's preliminary biochemical evidence for function. Um, it doesn't just exist for the known function, the known functional pseudogenes, as I, as I pointed out, but also for at least 80% of all the pseudogenes in humans, for example. And given all the data that, that we know, the evidence that we know, it's obvious that the other 20% may still yet to be discovered to be functional in some human tissue or even under some physiological condition that has yet been studied extensively. I mean, many non-coding RNA genes, such as these pseudogenes, they're only expressed under certain conditions. So the fact that he uses a lot of this evidence that assumes mutations are the source of all variety, that assumes that the majority of our genome is junk. And a lot of them will say, oh, we never predicted junk, but you can talk to scientists. I've debated scientists, evolutionists. They say that the, the genome can be no more than 20% functional. Well, we're predicting that the vast, vast majority of our genome is functional and that's exactly what we're we're seeing because the scientists the findings the influx of scientific papers are finding that numerous of these so-called fossil sequences they're not pseudo after all and these genes are absolutely necessary and required to sustain healthy life processes in the cell um you can look at some that have been overturned. For example, the beta globin pseudogene, that has been completely overturned. The evolutionists used to say that this pseudogene is, is just a useless genomic fossil, according to their own evolutionary predictions. But this gene we now know is a highly functional and conveniently, it's, in, it's, it's an integrated feature of the human genome and it's actually essential. Uh, this supposed broken remnant of a ancient egg yolk gene or chicken gene, there's, there's no evidence for this remnant that it even exists. And it's instead this, this fragment appears to be a functional DNA element. Junk DNA era, it's dead. I mean, they'll say the gene order along chromosome has no function and apparently and consequently this shared gene order demonstrates common ancestry, but the gene order along chromosomes does indeed perform a function. Apparently, 
Jackson Weed here will say that, you know, humans are genetically closer to apes than to other, say, animal species, for example, using whatever type of gene sequencing, whatever type of phylogenetic analysis. And he says that it demonstrates common ancestry. But these relative hierarchies, they're actually characteristic of design because our model does actually predict design. Of course, if nested hierarchies, the classification of life, for example, can be compared to classification of modes of transportation on how different companies manufacture cars based on their similarities forming these hierarchies. Humans, pigs, rats, and ducks, they're all land dwelling. Even though they are separate kinds, according to our model, since they are all land dwelling, they can share similar nested hierarchies or design. It doesn't take much reflection at all to see how this model, the biblical creation model, the young earth creation model, predicts relative genetic hierarchies. And these are actually found in nature. For example, the God of the Bible, the one we are arguing for, he of course designed the entire universe. And this would actually consist of all the various kinds of biological life that actually live in it. We would then expect and predict to find that this life that God created fits a design, design pattern. So of course, if we as humans, according to the Bible, God created us in his image. We should be able to get a clear idea for what kinds of design patterns our creator God might have used. And we can get a sense for this and an idea for this by looking and studying and examining the patterns that actually result from human designs. And what we actually see is that means of transportation, they naturally fall into these, into this Linnaean style um, categories. And J Jackson Wheat here, he, he uses examples of transitional forms. But as we know, many products of human design also evidently span two very different categories. I hope even he can agree with me that boats and tanks fall into entirely different classes. And Dr. Stefan Frello used a lot of this evidence as well. I debated him and I would recommend going to watch it and seeing thorough refutations of these same, same tired arguments. But boats and tanks, they fall in, into two entirely different classes, yet there exist vehicles that actually blend the features of both these two extremely dissimilar means of transportation. Let's look at an amphibious assault vehicle, for example. This is resistant to classification. This would be the perfect example, according to the evolutionists, of a transitional form. But yet, what do we know? This vehicle is designed for the transitional environments between water and land. Basic rules of, say, efficiency and function, we predict function, will most certainly result in similar stages of manufacturing. If you want to look at nested hierarchies in DNA, well, it's obvious that we would find shared elements located in the blueprints of different manufacturing companies, say from across the entire planet. Let's take Toyota, let's take Chrysler, let's take Mercedes-Benz or BMW. Evidently, if the end products have similarities, the blueprints, of course, by necessity, have them as well. DNA hierarchies also fit the model of created heterozygosity and, and the, the model of biblical creation. So means of transportation, of course, they naturally fall and can be grouped into a hierarchical classification scheme. Like I said, this, these nested hierarchies, they're agnostic to the question of creation and evolution as there exists competing explanation. And just to put it into perspective, you know, I hope we can recognize and identify cars. Cars are obvious to anybody, even to a five-year-old. And even though I hope we can agree every car is unique, all cars do evidently share a set of features. For example, a certain range of height from the ground, four doors, four wheels, lack of a, uh, of a cab bed, among more. 
Now, if we shrink the list of features, we can now bring in SUVs and trucks into this same group. I'm sure you can see exactly where I'm going with this. Trucks as we know are, are higher off the ground than cars and since most trucks consist of a cab bed, the number of features shared among cars and trucks is less than those shared among just cars. And we can go on and on and on. We can then bring in motorcycles and so on. Technically the more vehicles that we actually group and throw into our transportation classification system, the smaller the list of shared Shared features becomes and this is exactly like the Linnaean classification system I mean I hope we can all see that at some point the list of shared features among modes of transportation as I am talking about here becomes very very small just think about bringing in and including boats and planes with land vehicles for example I mean we don't even have wheels on the list at this point this hierarchical pattern of life strongly suggests deliberate and intentional design but as i've said before we predict function we look to function and evolutionists themselves they can make specific predictions on dna function as we have done but they haven't and the trajectory strongly favors genome-wide functionality and the biblical creation model Cancer is a disease of genetic mutation, and it's these uh, changes in the DNA sequence that really affect the behavior of a cell and then can lead to tumor formation. And so what we wanted to do in this project was really try to understand all of the genetic mutations that are driving pancreas cancer by looking at regions of the genome that most people tend to ignore. And so when you think of uh, the human genome, you can liken it to a Broadway production where you have um, genes and the proteins that they encode are the actors, the ones that uh, we all really focus on. But it's important to remember that there are uh, people backstage, the producers, directors, stage hands, costume designers who are critically important for making sure that the actors are on the uh, stage when they should be saying the right lines and singing the right songs. And so while uh, most sequencing studies really focused on the genes, we really wanted to focus on the uh, accessory uh, regions of the DNA, the regulatory elements that tell genes when to turn on and when to turn off, really the stage hands of the genome. And so uh, what we did is we developed a, a new algorithm in collaboration with uh, Tyler Garvin and Mike Schatz here at Cold Spring Harbor and other scientists around the world uh, called Gecko. And what this algorithm does is it uh, looks through uh, the genome and looks through all the mutations that people have in cancer and tries to really pinpoint those in those regulatory regions that are going to have a really great impact on the uh, expression of genes that might be uh, driving tumorigenesis. And so we found really uh, a number of really exciting things when we wanted to um, apply gecko to pancreas cancer. So first we found that these mutations in these regulatory regions do exist and we could experimentally validate them back in the lab. Secondly, what we were able to find was a new uh, prognostic marker that might uh, tell patients uh, more about their uh, outcome when they are uh, diagnosed with the disease. And then finally, we found uh, patterns of these mutations suggesting that they're being acted on uh, during tumor evolution near certain genes and near certain pathways that are critically important for cancer progression. And uh, the implications of this is it really argues for uh, whole genome sequencing of cancer, not just looking at the genes, but looking at the regions around the genes in the genome that tell the genes what to do to really give us a more full understanding of uh, the genetics of disease. Now, the other um, part of this that we want to talk about is something called chromosome fusion. Now, I want to tell you a few facts, and then I'm going to tell you the evolutionary story to account for these facts. So, it is a fact that humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and it is a fact that chimps have 24. Okay, so there's a difference. Now, if we came from a common ancestor, why do we have 23 and chimps have 24? They have to account for that um, somehow. 
Now, when they did initial studies of um, human DNA, this is before sequencing was really common and really quick, uh, they, they would stain the DNA, uh, the chromosomes, and they could see what are called banding patterns. And they noticed the human chromosome 2 was very similar to chimp chromosomes 12 and 13. And so just to show you that, um, so this is the uh, real staining here, okay, uh, the real chromosomes, and then they show it to you in uh, a figure form. So human chromosome 2, they said, it's very similar to these two chromosomes, 12 and 13. All right, so they developed a story based off of that, and that story was, well, there must have been a fusion that occurred in the line leading to humans of two of those chromosomes, such so we have 23 and chimps have 24. So here's how the story goes. In the common ancestor, there were 24 pairs of chromosomes. After they diverged, okay, so humans are going down this path to become humans, chimps are going down this path to become chimps, there was a fusion in the human line. Okay, two chromosomes fused together, so therefore humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and since all humans come from them, all humans have 23. In the chimp line, that fusion did not occur. So just like the ancestor, they have 24 pairs of chromosomes. Since all chimps come from them, they have 24, all chimps have 24 pairs of chromosomes. Now, this is not based on any evidential um, experience. This is just a story that they had to develop to explain this. It's not like you can go in the fossils and find this, okay? That's not reality. So this is just the story they've developed to explain it. And they would even go so far, some of them, as to say, it is definitive proof that humans and chimps shared a common ancestor. Now, here's the thing. In science, we don't use the term definitive proof. <laughs> um, if you're going to use that, it's called a law. And, um, you know, you need to have a lot of things backing that up, backing that statement up, because that is a very strong statement. And I want to share with you just some quotes from a few theistic evolutionists, again, professing Christians, but they believe in evolution in millions of years to, to kind of show that. Uh, the first is from Dr. Francis Collins, the head of the NIH. He said, the fusion that occurred as we evolved from the apes has left its DNA imprint here. It is very difficult to understand this observation without postulating a common ancestor. He said, how is it that human chromosome 2 looks so similar to chimps chromosomes 12 and 13 unless there was a fusion that occurred? I mean, how else can you explain that is basically what he's saying. This next quote comes from Ken Miller, and he's a molecular biologist and theistic evolutionist, and he, write, and he said, you know what? If we don't find it, if we don't find a fused chromosome in humans, evolution is wrong. We don't share a common ancestor. Whoa. Okay, so you're willing to bet it all on one <laughs> piece of evidence. And so, um, and what's interesting is this quote comes from a YouTube video that someone posted of his lecture, and they labeled it How to Shut Up Pesky Creationists. <laughs> um, it has been viewed nearly two million times. Okay, so this is a very common thing that people will use to, so to speak, to say that, you know, we're wrong, chimps and humans definitely had a common ancestor. Now, Although he says this, and he's made this statement actually several times, that he'd be willing to change his mind, basically, if it could be shown otherwise, I don't believe it. Um, because I can show that human chromosome 2 is not the result of a fusion. He has been presented with that evidence, and he has not changed his mind. Why? Because this isn't about the evidence. Okay, the evidence is clear. Um, it's about a worldview, and not wanting to change that worldview even in spite um, of the obvious, okay, wanting to cling to that. So let's sum, let me summarize here what their supposed proof of evolution is. So they, uh, or that we shared a common ancestor with the apes. So again, chromosomes 12 and 13 were in the ancestor, okay, and in the line leading to humans, a fusion occurred, and so now we have one that's known as chromosome 2 in human. This has gone so far, so to speak, that in chimps, they don't have chromosomes 12 and 13 anymore. They relabeled them 2A and 2B to represent the fact that they think it's a fusion that occurred in the human line. That's, that's how strong this belief is. Now, if a fusion had occurred, what would we expect to see? There should be telltale signs of that. So you see these little um, dark blue caps on the ends of the chromosomes. Those are called telomeres. They're certain sequences of DNA. It kind of repeats itself over and over again. They serve as end caps to kind of protect the DNA. And interestingly enough, one of their jobs is to prevent fusion. So I'm kind of struggling how they were involved in a fusion when that's one of their jobs is to prevent it. So we should see a bunch of telomere sequences right there. The other thing is this little red um, symbolic uh, square here, that's a centromere. Every chromosome has one centromere. And it's important when the cells um, are dividing and the DNA material needs to be divided up between the two cells. 
there are certain sequences associated with those. So we should see one in the fused chromosome. It's not active anymore, but it should be there along with the real one. So that's what we should see. So we can sequence human chromosome two, and we can look for those things, and that's what they've done. And so what did they find? Well, they're having trouble finding a lot of those telomeres in the middle. There's some sequences there that are sort of kind of like telomeres, but not nearly in the number they should be, okay, if they're truly telomeres. So that's a problem, okay? Um, the telomere sequences, even the evolutionists would admit that they're ve it's very, very degenerate. And they kind of scratch their heads like, well, why is it so degenerate? Why aren't there more telomere sequences here? Because it's not a fusion. <laughs> um, that's why. There's no del there shouldn't be any telomeres there because it's not two chromosomes that have fused together. Then they looked at, they looked for that centromere, that other centromere that should be there, and they can't really find it. There's some sequences there um, that sometimes are associated with centromeres, but they're certainly not unique to centromeres. We find them in other places. So that's a problem as well. That other inactivated centromere isn't there. Now, there's many other lines of evidence that Dr. Tompkins has developed to show that it just not, doesn't look like a fused chromosome. It doesn't match up with chromosomes 12 and 13. And one of them that he found, and he's published on this, and you'll see the reference in the next slide, is he found a gene there, okay, that spans the fusion site. Genes are always found on just one chromosome. I mean, they don't, it's not part of the genes here on this chromosome and part of the genes over here on this chromosome, okay? That doesn't happen. Um, the gene's always on the one on one chromosome. So how could it be that you somehow had parts of it on both and then they oh, fused together and now those parts are together? That's just not realistic. Um, so here's the supposed fusion site and here's the gene, right? Part of it's on one part, one side and part of it's on the other side. The other thing is telomeres don't occur in the middle of genes. I mean, genes aren't around telomeres. So, um, so that it, it's just filled, filled with a lot of problems. And the conclusion is the human chromosome two is not the result of a fusion. It just doesn't match up sequence wise with chimp chromosomes 12 and 13. So therefore it cannot support common ancestry for humans and chimps. Jackson Reed assumes that humans and chimpanzees are related through common ancestry at all. But at the end of the day, this data here, I'll just present just a few forms of evidence that completely destroy the idea that humans and chimpanzees are actually related through common ancestry. They'll say human chimpanzee are genetically identical by 98 to 99%. And yet we now know that this is based tremendously off of preferential and selective treatment of data. In other words, cherry pick data. What they're using is they're using sequences that they actually ex expect to be similar. They don't include non-aligned DNA, gaps, copy number variations, and size differences. So sure, based on cherry pick data and selective treatment of data, they might be able to get 98 to 99% similarity but when you actually include and acknowledge it all such as these gaps or these copy number variations this non-aligned dna then what you actually get is something more like 88 percent or even lower and at the end of the day that's over 400 million dna differences that actually exist between the two species and most or nearly all the secular research reports on this human chimp dna similarity omit significant amounts of data that do not align with each other and there's significant DNA sequence discontinuity between the two genomes. That evolution, bacteria to biologist, evolution cannot explain or even account for. At the end of the day, the reality is that humans are not apes and they were actually created separately and uniquely in the image of God. And not only does the Bible prove this, but so does DNA evidence. We can look to the Y chromosome. This is just icing on the cake at this point because Y chromosome DNA destroys human evolution. The extensively and remarkably different DNA sequence of the Y chromosomes between human and chimp presents a very, very serious and detrimental problem. It's destructive. It's actually a fatal blow for common ancestry because given the low the extremely low level of recombination and DNA sequence diversity on the Y chromosome, the human evolution paradigm encounters a fatal blow, as I've said, and a very serious problem.
This problem is that the human and chimp Y chromosomes should be considerably more similar to each other. If human evolution was true, they should be the most similar chromosomes in the genome because they are so stable. In other words, there's a small amount of variation. And why is this the case? Especially when we know that every single human being on the, on the planet is extremely similar genetically. 0.5% difference max, I believe it is. And all male Y chromosomes on the planet, almost identical, but yet chimp to human Y chromosome, 70% dissimilar. There's just so much evidence that destroys this idea of human to chimp ancestry. More icing on the cake. Let's look at orphan genes, for example. Orphan genes, they're fully functional gene sequences that code for both a functional messenger RNA and a protein, and they lack similar counterparts in other organisms. Orphan genes that are specific to humans are powerful evidence against the idea that we evolved from apes. Why is this? Well, it's because these genes appear fully formed, uniquely integrated into the complexity of the human genomic network and clearly functional. And of course, very important to numerous cellular processes. And there's no evidence for common ancestry with apes or any other creatures. So as usual, as has been demonstrated here, in this short time, in this short video, genetics once again proves biblical creation and destroys fish to fisherman evolution. This amazing category of genes are taxonomically restricted genes that are unique, absolutely unique to each type of organism. These genes appear suddenly without any trace of ancestry in apes or any other animal. They don't fit the hypothetical fairy tale of evolutionary theory. And that's what evolutionists like Jackson Wheat here do, is they do a lot of imagining. That type of large-scale evolution only happens and occurs in the imaginations of those that actually want to believe in it. Orphan genes are evidently part of the genomic landscape that is indicative of each created kind and the explanation of orphan genes fits the biblical model of created kinds, as does all of other genetic evidence. The orphan genes are especially needed for the uniqueness associated with each created kind, as described in the book of Genesis. Aside from genetic predictions, evolution also makes fossil predictions. And when those predictions fail, they are not held as evidence against evolution, they're just ignored completely. Looking at the fossil record, we can see that ocean life dies in the ocean and land life dies on land. That's how it works. So we would expect to see aquatic life in deep sea layers because they were dying there far before the flood occurred. And until the flood came, which wrecked havoc on life existing at that time, causing dinosaur graveyards and things like that. Remember, when things die on land, they get eaten or degrade rather fast. The odds of life dying to make the quantity of oil that we find on Earth today is best explained by the flood. It's also safe to say that the fossil record is not valid when we find evidence of discrepancies in the record. And guess what? We do. The upside-down geologic column in Pakistan is one such place. At the foot of the Karakul Ram Mountains in the Salt Range Formation, scientists have discovered fossilized plants and insects. From the evolutionary perspective, these remains belong to the upper part of the geological column. However, this formation lies beneath the Cambrian rock, which is dated back to full for 400 million years. Discoveries such as these support the biblical version of the Earth's history, whereby the geological column is primarily a consequence of the global flood and its aftermath. It is no surprise that there is some order to the fossil record, such as sea creatures buried beneath land creatures and mobile creatures such as birds near the top. But, since, as the Salt Range Formation testifies, the ordered charts that adorn textbooks aren't always what they find in the field. Many results today have kicked evolution hard in the dirt. They have found complete stasis in the entire Pliocene era. We also know that the Ashley Phosphate Beds in North Carolina have found human bones and artifacts with dinosaurs together. Also remember that they also found modern-day birds dating back in the Cambrian rock layers which supposedly evolved from dinosaurs. It's a total mess. Also consider that many of the biggest dinosaurs, such as the long-necked sauropods like the Brachiosaurus, Titanosaurus, and 
Apatosaurus would have eaten colossal amounts of vegetation. So why do we not find such abundance of these plants in the rocks containing these dinosaur fossils? Take for example the Morrison Formation in Montana. Even though this formation had yielded many dinosaur fossils, they're very scarce in vegetation. This phenomenon of missing vegetation doesn't just apply to dinosaurs or their rock layers. The Coconino Sandstone in the Grand Canyon has many animal trackways, but it's almost devoid of plants. These rocks tell us something profound about Earth's history. They suggest that these deposits laid down are not ecosystems buried over eons of time. Otherwise, we'd find more evidence as plants that the animals ate. Instead, the evidence fits nicely with the biblical model of early Earth's history, whereas these animals were transported and buried catastrophically during Noah's flood. Geologists have assumed and say that calm weather conditions are required for these settling processes to occur to form mudstone. Therefore, whenever they encounter mud deposits, they interpret them as forming in tranquil water environments. However, recent research published in the prestigious Journal of Science has turned this argument on its head. The researchers showed that mud deposits form from rapidly flowing water. Yet again, evolutionary theory fails when put to the test, and we have more evidence for a global flood. Darwin also observed that the bones inside the wings of birds looked like they were fingers that got fused together. So he predicted that a fossil of an ancient bird with separate fingers would be found one day. This ended up being Archaeopteryx. You can find almost anything if you look in the fossil record that resembles something else. That means nothing. Paleontologist Lawrence Whitmer of Ohio University in a commentary stated, Perhaps the time has come to finally accept that Archaeopteryx was just another small, feathered, bird-like theropod fluttering around in the Jurassic. What do evolutionists say about fully modern birds found in the early strata before Archaeopteryx supposedly evolved these fused fingers together? You guessed it, nothing. Stephen Jay Gould said, It's a curious mosaic, not a transitional fossil. Even the stink bird, Alive today is a species of tropical bird found in swamps, forests, and mangroves in the Amazon and in South America. It is notable for having chicks that possess claws. The truth? Hand claws are actually widespread in modern birds, and not all that unusual. Ornithologists say Archaeopteryx is a bird, as where paleontologists say it's a dinosaur. Not even a consensus between the sciences. Another example of a very precise prediction concerns our yolk. However, eutherian mammals like us have a placenta that made the yolk sac obsolete. <laughs> the yolk sac is not obsolete. Think about it. If the yolk sac is a worthless remnant nowadays, like he says, then obviously it can be cut off from the human embryo because it isn't needed, right? Not at all. The yolk sac is the source of the human embryo's first blood cells and a blood nutrient supply. It's 100% required, as death would result without it. Lumen, the Boundless Anatomy and Physiology website, even tells us, blood is conveyed in the walls of the sac by the primary aorta. After circulating through a wide-meshed capillary plexus, it is returned by the vitiline veins in the tubular heart of the embryo. This vitiline circulation absorbs nutrient material from the yolk sac that is conveyed to the embryo. It is true that the yolk sac of birds and reptiles contain yolk to nourish the embryo, but the placental mammal's yolk contains no yolk at all. Also, this so-called yolk sac is not a source of nourishment as it is for birds, or in a bird egg. Rather, its purpose and design is that of blood supply, proving it is not proof of evolutionary leftover remnants. To say that it's lost its primary function is intellectually dishonest. It's always had a function, and it was that of blood supply. Even Wikipedia acknowledges its importance by saying its function as the developmental circulatory system of the human embryo before internal circulation begins. Even embryologists today no longer call it a yolk sac, but umbilical vessel, because of its vital importance. This excerpt was taken from Larson's Human Embryology, 4th edition. The definitive yolk sac remains a major structure associated with the developing embryo through the fourth week and performs important early functions. Extraembryotic mesoderm forming in the outer layer of the yolk sac is a major site of hematopoiesis. Primordial germ cells can first be identified in humans in the wall of the yolk sac. Even by mistake or mutation, a human being cannot produce yolks or gills because we don't have, and never had, the DNA instructions for that. It's disingenuous to say that this proves evolution. 
EvenStudy.com states, It was originally thought that human yolk sac was a vestigial organ, no longer of use to the embryo. But research over the past decade or so has brought new insight into the use of the yolk sac by the embryo. Also consider vitrilline circulation, the system of blood flowing from the embryo to the yolk sac and back again. This system would not even exist at all without the yolk sac. This was never a useless, leftover remnants of a yolk sac. It was never a yolk sac at all, and should never have been called one. Hence, the modern day name change. Do you see the lengths evolutionists have to go to to present any evidence to support the lie? One can only wonder why evolutionists would call the structure by the wrong name and label it a primitive, when it's absolutely necessary for the survival of the developing individual. However, eutherian mammals like us have a placenta that made the yolk sac obsolete. Paleontologists predicted an ant fossil that had features of wasps in the Cretaceous and that was confirmed as Sphecomirma. For one thing, this species was never found to ever have any wings. No Sphecomirma hamuli was ever found around the anterior portions. As were wasps, their fore and hind leg wings are hooked together with groups with tiny little hooks called hamuli, which ants do not have. Also consider, according to evolutionists, it was believed that this evolutionary age of 79 to 92 million years ago, there had not yet been any complex social organizations of ants into colonies. However, with careful analysis of these specimens, it reveals the presence of the metapleural gland, which is only found in ants and only those that live in colonies. These glands secrete antibiotics which prevent bacteria and fungi entering the colonies. Ants were always ants. They never transitioned into flying, nor became wasps. Not a single drop of observational or testable science proves that ants became wasps. It's complete and utter nonsense, and it amazes me how so many otherwise intelligent people fall for it and believe the liars, and so arrogantly so, even defending those that indoctrinated them, and then get mad at those who are showing them that they were lied to. This shows the true power of cognitive dissonance. Evolution is, in fact, the greatest lie man has ever been told. Even as far back as 2005, a peer-reviewed study found that we match primates as low as 86%. Evolutionists have said that if we do not match great apes more than other mammals, then the case for common ancestry is debunked and falsified. Guess what? When testing the protein coding regions of other species, we have found that dogs, cats, pigs, and other species have more relation than primates do. So not only have we falsified evolution through fast-ticking mitochondrial clocks, debunking junk DNA, human language formation cannot arise on its own, but now, genetic relation. It has been falsified. Evolution is through.